By the 1950s, trams in Britain were seen as quaint, old-fashioned, and even a little bit ridiculous. In places like Blackpool and Crick Tramway Museum, they have novelty value, but in real life, big boy places, they were dismissed as obsolete. Cars had multiplied on Britain's streets like rabbits, except not as cute. And if you couldn't afford one of them, then a bus was your preferred method of transport. However, ironically, by as early as the 1960s, following years of obsession with cars, the government was beginning to recognise the problem now caused by traffic congestion in Britain's larger cities. And ideas were beginning to bubble up again about alternative methods. In Manchester, one obvious problem was the fact that the two biggest rail stations in the city, Victoria and London Road, now Piccadilly, weren't directly connected to each other. This meant that if you arrived in the city from the south but needed to head north, you'd either have to ride a complicated set of train lines to get there, or walk a terrifying 20 minute walk through the city centre. Through the 60s, 70s and 80s, a number of ideas had surfaced to solve this crosstown problem, including monorails, gondolas and sky buses, whatever the hell that is. There had even been talk of a rudimentary underground being built, the Pick Vic Line. However, economic downturn in the 1970s ended all ideas of building the train link, or indeed a London-style underground that was separate from the network. It took until 1987 for the decision to settle on what was called light rail. This would take the old-style electric trams with overhead wires and put them, ironically, on the same abandoned train lines that now lay around the city. So much for forward thinking. The idea of using existing and former railway lines was a clever one. Trams were better than trains because they could stop at more local stops and run more frequently. And better than buses because they couldn't get stuck in traffic and could toot along quite speedily. The first phase of this newly coined Metro Link was opened between Bury and Victoria Station, using, strangely, an existing railway line that had to be converted. This would then, crucially, cross the city centre and join with Piccadilly Station, before heading south all the way to Altrincham. The trams used were T68s, which sounds like robots from the future sent to kill us, but were actually benevolent and boxy and hardly killed anyone at all. Its success was greater than expected, and so planners hurried ahead planning extensions. The best candidate for phase two was a branch to Eccles in the west, which had poor transport links, and would also pass by Salford Quays, which back then had stopped being a sad place for worn out old shipyards and become somewhere of shiny glass office blocks instead. Completed in 2001, the new route proved popular too, branching off from Cornbrook and including the new and exciting sounding stops of Exchange Quay, Salford Quays, Anchorage, Harbour City and Broadway, and the not so exciting sounding Langworthy, Weast, Ladywell and Eccles. But it was only four miles long and hardly revolutionary, even if it did run nearly entirely without the help of former railway lines. And it also included a station here at Pomona, a massive area of wasteland just outside the city. Now for a long time this was one of the quietest stations along the entire line and trams generally wasted time just stopping here. But in fact it turned out it was a, a wonderful piece of foresight from the planners because now today in the 2020s this area is now getting built up into a residential area and the station itself is one of the busiest interchanges on the entire route. Phase 3 then got a bit excited, wanting to add four new lines to the network. Joining the city with Oldham and Rochdale in the north, Chalton and East Didsbury in the south, Ashton Underline in the east, 
and a tiny spur off the Eccles line in order to reach Salford Quays and Media City more conveniently. Not surprisingly, central government balked at the ambitious new project, mumbled something about costs and forced the phase to be split into 3A and 3B. Plan 3A got underway because it was easy to implement, but wasn't without controversy. For a start, in order to reach Oldham and Rochdale, bizarrely, it meant getting rid of an entire existing railway line. It also meant saying goodbye to Oldham Mumps Station and the adjacent viaduct, which was a bit of a local landmark, replacing it with a big nothing. Also, Oldham was now one of the largest towns in the country without a mainline train station. In the south, the tram to East Didsbury only went as far as St Werber's Road and used the former Cheshire Lines Committee Railway to connect to Cornbrook, which was now becoming a bit of a hub despite being in the middle of bloody nowhere. In the east, the line to Ashton had to actually use the road most of the way, only getting off to swing around the back of the city of Manchester Stadium. In phase 3A, this only went as far as Droylston, but was hammered through to Ashton Town Centre by 2013 and the start of phase 4, sorry, 3B. 3B also saw the southern line pushed on towards East Didsbury using another old railway line and then finally extensions into the centre of Oldham Town Centre and Rochdale Town Centre Centre Centre. <laughs> and then in 2014, a trambitious extension to Manchester Airport was built, spurring out of St Werber's Road and crossing the River Mersey here at this magnificent concrete monster of a bridge. From here it wiggled southwards through Withenshaw and 13 other stations before reaching the airport. By the end of 2014 it was almost 93 kilometres long, making it the longest tramway in the country. In the fifth phase, what should have been called the fourth phase, but it was actually called phase 2CC, a second city crossing was built, easing congestion through Piccadilly Gardens. The new line diverted down the side of the town hall and along Cross Street. It was just 1.3 kilometers long and added a single station to the route, Exchange Square, which was within spitting distance of its nearest neighbor, Victoria Station. But it did allow commuters to offload right outside the Arndale Shopping Center, which everyone knows is the most important place in the city center. And while this was great and all, it did mean that the entire heart of Manchester's St Peter's Square had to undergo a massive overhaul, including moving the cenotaph and the entire deletion of the Peace Gardens. Manchester Metrolink has gone through various phases in design too, originally using the GMT logo and then deciding on a horrible grey and aquamarine combination that stayed around for quite a while. Eventually, a rebranding gave the system a fresh, modern feeling with yellow, Reminiscent of more European style tram services, but also, coincidentally, the Mersey Rail branding over in Liverpool. Finally, and eventually, a new line was approved in 2016 to take trams to the massive out of town shopping centre in Trafford, aptly named the Trafford Centre. The bigger, badder, pretty arrival to the Arndale. It will bring lines closer to Manchester United and the Imperial War Museum without asking passengers to walk for more than two minutes from the other stops. Despite the money people in government wringing their hands, Manchester Metrolink has been a roaring success. Now it's got its problems and it has meant the loss of some historic railway lines, stations, viaducts and green corridors. But it's a modern transport system which should serve the city for decades to come. So what about the future? There are still plenty of extensions that the Giddy planners can plan. What about places that haven't been touched by the Metrolink? including Stockport, Bolton and Wigan. And is it even needed? Is it not better to invest that money in the antiquated railway service? 
And if they do expand, will it be future-proof? Well, find out in the next exciting episode of Trams. <laughs>